Welcome to Memo Q Talks, where we talk to industry leaders about their experiences, lessons learned, and what works best across all areas of localization. Now, here's your host. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Memo Q Talks. My name is Mark Schreiner, and I'll be your host for this episode of Memo Q Talks. Today, we're going to be talking with our colleague, Santiago de Miguel, who is a gaming solution engineer for, I said it, Memo Q. Um, he's also the founder of Your Game in Spanish, a one-stop solution for developers, game publishers, and translation agencies looking to localize into Spanish. Santiago has a lot of experience as a freelance translator, and, um, and we're going to talk to him about, I don't know, life in Argentina, uh, you know, regular localization versus game localization, some best practices for game localization, and a bunch of other things. We're just going to see where this conversation goes. But before we do that, let's, uh, let's say hello. Santiago, how are you today? Hey, Mark, thanks a lot for having me here. I'm excited to talk to you. And I'm doing fine. Thanks. Right. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Where, where are you located? I'm in Buenos Aires, Argentina right now. Buenos Aires. You know, I've never been uh, to Argentina. Like, what's That's the... very nice. I, I, I hear amazing things about it, amazing food. Um, so what's the, what's the big difference for you when you get home? Because, you know, like you were just been in Europe uh, and, and you get back. What's like, oh my gosh, this mm -hmm. is so cool that I'm back here. What's the thing that stands out for you? Well, I mean, this is kind of a cliche, but many people say this about Argentinians. We are... Cool people. I don't know if me, but in general, <laughs> people are very nice. We're very touchy. We kiss each other all the time. Not good for COVID, I know, but uh, <laughs> we've been missing that and it's coming back again. So I'd say that the general vibe is very nice with people. Uh, of course, there are some other not very nice things going on, but um, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the vibe. vibe, the vibe thing is it's it's cool because you know every country has its own vibe, and some of them are much stronger than others. Um, and so, for example, you know, I, I lived in Japan, and Japan is. Uh, mm -hmm. quiet, orderly, even in the big city, you know, things are somewhat orderly and, and everything just works to a certain level. People are very, I would not call them touchy, feely, huggy, kissy, <laughs> definitely not. Um, but very polite and reserved. And even though you're in a city with 25 million people, you don't feel, unless you're on the subway, you don't feel that, um, I don't know, crowded. Whereas if you go to China, for example, things are kind of frenetic and just on the go and, you know, you get this electricity. Very, very different. And uh, so that sounds pretty cool. It's, it's just people seem, seem pretty chill. Yeah, yeah. I mean... There's something we say here that you never get bored in Argentina. Mm -hmm. uh, that kind of goes uh, in many, it has many meanings. There okay. are lots of things to do. Uh, since I live in Buenos Aires, I'll be mainly speaking about Buenos Aires, but Argentina is a very diverse country. Yeah, let me say that. Uh, so you can have lots of entertainment and there's always something going on, whether good, bad, <laughs> So, So, so. So, yeah. so, I mean, and, and I'm just curious because as a freelance translator, which you've done in the past, um, you kind of have to be, you, you have to manage your own time, your own schedule, right? And so what I'm yeah. hearing is, is there are opportunities to be distracted. Uh, and, and so how did you, how did you manage that? Well, I'm still a freelancer as well. I work with MemoQ and I'm also freelancing for video mm -hmm. game companies. Uh, fortunately for me, I'm a very organized guy. So I don't really have a problem with that. I like to have a schedule. I wake up at 7.30, I start work at 8.30. Then I, in the afternoon, I translate up to around four or five, and that's it. Uh, so I'm quite organized. Uh, I don't usually work on weekends, uh, but I have many colleagues that they have a mess, you know, being freelancer, oh, time management for them is really, really hard. So it's a big uh, challenge. Let me yeah, let me let me ask you one silly question though. Um, are you you're below the equator, right? Yeah. So I've been told that when you flush the toilet, in in when you're between northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere, the water swirls the other way. Is there any truth I, to that? I've never been below the equator. I mean, the farthest south I've been is Singapore, and I'm pretty sure that's just right on the equator. So the toilet doesn't do anything. I don't know. <laughs> Anything. It doesn't flush at all. No, I like. Yeah. Uh, 
you know, I mean, if you ask me, I don't even know what, what way it turns right here. I mean, I can go check right now. Well, no, no, but okay, you get back to me on this, all right? <laughs> because inquiring okay. minds want to know. The other, the other not so silly question I got to ask you is what is that ancient piece of machinery behind you? Uh, that's a typewriter. It actually has a, there's a nice story about it. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a gift from my neighbor, a very old lady who passed away recently. And she gave it to me because here in, in my building, there is no lift. So there are only stairs. She was very old and she once fell from the stairs and had a really bad accident. And I heard that I was in the kitchen cooking and I heard a huge noise. So I just opened the window, looked, and she was there lying on the ground was bloody uh so it was nice uh and i went there helped her she was okay fortunately and it was just a thank you gift she gave me that's and awesome months later she, she passed uh, away i'm yeah. sorry about that but um no i mean it's 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 cool i you know it's it's funny i just read a book and they talked about how the advent of the typewriter um actually uh -huh. so for example nishki um was he was in so much pain that he couldn't write uh, by hand anymore. And so he started to use a typewriter. Um, but then the argument goes that a lot of people started using the typewriter, but the the machine, the technology started to affect how they write. Uh, and okay. they would use certain word choices that they wouldn't use, um, for example, if they were writing by hand. And it's it, it, and, and then if you bring it forward to our industry, then you have tools that give you pre-translated segments and, and, or, uh, what we have is predictive typing. So it starts to complete yeah. your sentence for you. I'm, I'm just curious. And this, we're jumping way ahead right now, but does that affect you as a translator at all? When you see a previously translated segment and it, 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 it does it be like, oh, okay. I probably wouldn't say it that way, but now I'm going to, because I'm kind of led down that path. How, how, how do you deal with that? Yeah. Well, I think that are two very big things on that topic and it's super interesting. Uh, I've talked about this with colleagues before. Fuzzy matches from, you know, translation memories, they, of course, will affect your choices, but I think that they should, at least in gaming, you know, for consistency purposes. It's not the same to translate a piece of software than it is to translate literature. You know, in some fields, maybe you must change those fancy matches because they don't fit in the context. In some others, they are needed to keep consistency, okay? So there are two different things, two different aspects to fancy matches. However, then there is machine translation and that's a different thing. I don't usually use machine translation a lot. It's still not a huge thing in gaming, even though it's growing and becoming more popular. But when I've used it in other fields and you read the machine translated match, and result, you're done. I mean, your <laughs> mind gets fixed into that option and it's very hard, you know, to move away from it. So yeah, I've talked about this with a colleague and what we used to do was, okay, read the source first, try to think of my own translation and then just read the machine translation translated result so that it didn't affect my lexical choices that much. Yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of so like, I mean, because we talk a lot about training the MT engines, uh, but mm -hmm. at the same time that we're training them, I think they, they could be training us. Uh, and I mean, if you, if you just look at, yeah. web, you know, uh, generated, auto-generated content on the web, a lot of the content on the web yeah. these days is uh, machine generated. And, yeah. and, I, and I, I'm sure it affects us our lexicon, like you said. I mean, we, started, we start using words and word choices and grammatical patterns that maybe we wouldn't normally use. So interesting. Yeah, hey. yeah. of course, that, that has to do also with the, the fields in which you work. You know, I'm translating one of the main games in Translate is a word game. So it's not super literate. It's more like technical. And then when I have to jump into a more literary game, I find it hard at first, you know? Mm. So yeah, lots of things affect how you write. Well, let's go back to, to that. Um, you know, you mentioned the difference for, for gaming. Uh -huh. Why is why is gaming different? How is it different? And in the gaming, you've already said that there are different types of games. So explain, please. Yeah, well, it's a very versatile industry, I'd say. Um, so you have some like technical translations in every game. That's inevitable because you have user interface. Then maybe the game you're translating is technical in itself. I mean, you have car games, you have sports games. 
they require very specific terminology. You can you even have surgeon simulator games, uh, you know, flight simulators. Those games can get very, very technical. So you have that. But at the same time, you have games that are very literary, games that have like short stories within the games. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I'm thinking of The Witcher saga. I always talk about them. You can you can get books in the game. You open them, of course, it's not a hundred page books, but it's just a couple of pages of just literary text. And in that same game, then you need to translate the user interface. You need to translate weapon descriptions that are very technical, very strict in regard to their structure. Um, then you have subtitling as well in, in the videos, okay? Cinematics, you have interviews with developers, you have trailers. So it's super, super diverse. So, so uh, just just saying that you do game localizations is still quite broad then. I mean, um, so do, do, do some uh, translators specialize in a very specific part of, of a gaming, a certain genre, or, um, cause you mentioned, you know, you, you could have literary yeah. components to a game. You could have the UI, you could have, um, the, the, the spe technical specifications of the, the weapons. I mean, do people specialize yeah. to that level? They do. They do. Uh, I wouldn't say this, that, that people specialize in specific parts of the game, but definitely in specific genres. In fact, if you apply, for a job, maybe for an agency, they will ask you, not always, but many times, they will ask you uh, about your experience, of course, which game genres you've translated and which games you play as well. Uh, so which are your favorite games, which genres you like, you feel comfortable with. So for instance, if I get, I don't know, a golf game, I'll try not to do that because I have no idea about I'll do that. that. <laughs> That's about the only okay. game that I know. <laughs> like I'm talking I about online it. games, everything offline. If it had, if it's got yeah any kind of offline sports element to it, I'll do it. <laughs> That's cool. Or, you know, cards, games, poker. No. I don't know about that. So you're, you're, yeah. so, so what, what um, genre do you focus on and in, in, in what games do you, do you play? Well, I currently work, uh, as I was saying, in a war game, okay. I have no idea. Honestly, before doing that, I didn't have that terminology of weapons, tanks, planes. I had to Google a lot, do a lot of research, talk to a friend of mine who does mm -hmm. love all that. Uh, fortunately, that, that there's a lot of information about that. Uh, so that's one thing I do. And then just more like fantasy games. I really like those. Those are my favorites because I can be creative. I actually started studying translation because I wanted to be a literary translator. Then I moved on to subtitling and then to video games uh, because I, I like the creative part of the of the job. So whenever I see fantasy, you know, epic, all those things, all those topics, uh, I try to focus on those. Do you, do you have any uh, favorite uh, fa fantasy? Novels like you know before you started in games, you know, you, you, did, oh, you, did you translate Harry anything? Potter? Harry Potter, Definitely. yeah, yeah. I'm a Potterhead. <laughs> I love it. A Potterhead. I've never heard that. I, I, it's amazing that all yeah. these years. I mean, because Pothead. I mean, I've never heard Potterhead. That's that's awesome. Man. <laughs> Potterhead, definitely a different one. Not Pothead. <laughs> So I'm a um, I'm I, I'm I guess uh, a little bit older school. Um, I'm a, a, a Tolkien uh -huh. fan, and I don't know if you saw in multilingual, okay. but they um, uh, Cameron Rasm Rasmussen he uh, he did this article. I can see if we can see it here. Uh, that starts talking uh -huh. about the languages of Tolkien because okay. he made up his own languages, man. I mean, you know, yeah, several of them. Yeah, I mean, like, how much time did that guy have, man? <laughs> He's like, I think I'm going to make a language, and he made like Elvish, and then he made Old Elvish, and then he made new elvish and <laughs> yeah yeah i mean the lord of the rings i think it's on another level uh i tried to read the books but when i was just a kid i didn't really get into those uh of course i love the movies and everything but i still i need to give the books another chance definitely i i would if i would start with with the hobbit because it sets mm -hmm. the uh it sets kind of the background and it's it's very accessible, um, yeah, and yeah. then and then and then the the three the, we call them the trilogy, um, the three books yeah, of the, 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 the yeah. Um, I just I just started to read the uh, Silmarillion, 
um, yeah. which is super, there's, there's like a thousand different names and characters and things. And, and it's, wow. it's really hard to follow and it doesn't follow up perfectly linear fashion. So mm -hmm. I'm just saying it's probably not the best one to start with, even though it does give you yeah. the ultimate background, but yeah. Anyway. Hey, um, so let's, let's go back to, to game localization. Um, yeah. so first off, if anybody wants to get started in game localization, what's the, what's the, the route that you would recommend? Well, what I always recommend to students is do a workshop, you know, a course. Uh, I don't know how universities are around the world, but at least in Argentina, we still don't get localization uh, assignments, uh, courses in the degree itself, the translation degree. We do have translation degrees. That's a big plus we have here. So lots of practice from day one, but we don't have localization at all except in one single place. So translating games can be very different from translating any other type of text. So that's my number one suggestion. Learn it first, okay? Before doing anything, try to complete a course, a workshop, uh, so that you get used to working with tags, working with variables, working without context. Uh, so those are really, really big things in gaming. Um, that would be number one. After that, I think the easiest route is to start working with localization agencies. Um, they are looking for people every single day. Uh, right now, game localization is huge. It's been booming um, for the past couple of years. Uh, the pandemic actually was beneficial for games. More people played at home, more money coming into games, more games being developed, more games being localized. So there's a lot of demand right now. So it shouldn't be super hard, you know, to get started with an agency. Of course, they will probably ask for experience, but that's when workshops come into play, in my opinion. That's experience. If you translate a game in a workshop, even if it's not a paid job, I consider that experience, okay? If I'm recruiting someone, I see that you completed a workshop and you translated game there, okay, that's enough. And if you are finding a hard time getting that first paid job, then you can do some uh, free jobs, you know, for indie developers who are not charging for their games. There are lots of passionate people here just developing games for free uh, because they love it. So why not help them localize their games? Um, they will put in the credits uh, and you will be able to talk about the game, show that as experience. And that's a great way to, to get started. Definitely. I think it's some, some awesome advice. And what I really like about it is you're leading with, Hey, if you're interested in it, just do it any way you can, you know, um, whether mm -hmm. it's an unpaid workshop, whether it's um, working with indie, indie game developers for um, free or almost free, just mm -hmm. get that experience and get your foot in the door. And I guess some of the most successful people I've seen in in every industry that I've worked in are people who came to that industry because of their own passion, not necessarily looking to make a buck. I mean, one of the most talented mm -hmm. IT professionals that, uh, that I've ever worked with was a Swiss gentleman, never went to university, never studied, um, ITs or computers, but he just, he was just fanatical about it since like middle school. Yeah. And he would go from like operating systems and he's like, okay, I want to learn everything about operating systems. And then he would go to databases and then it was, you know, everything on the internet. And it's just like that kind of, you know, passion is, is going to win out over the long run. But so that's great, great advice. Um, I, I do know, you know, it's funny because I was at gala in San Diego and mm -hmm. they gave an award for the, the country that was most represented or had the most people in attendance. And Argentina won out, which surprised me because it's a long yeah. ways. Wow. <laughs> and, um, but there were all these super nice people there that showed up. And, um, and, and I, I'm curious, one of the kind of more controversial things that I hear from some of the Argentinian local professionals has to do with rates and pricing and um, that they're sometimes considered to be an unfair advantage, say, between European languages, um, let me, European translators, I should say, and translators yeah. located in South or Central America. What are your thoughts on that topic? And also, what advice would you give to freelancers so that you, you don't sell yourself short? Yeah, that's a, that's a tricky topic. Um, I mean, rates, my number one suggestion for Latin American translators in general is 
try to aim for American or European or Asian companies. I work for a lot of Asian companies right now. Um, yeah, Argentina has a very big localization and translation industry. There are lots of companies here, but unfortunately the rates that they pay are not usually great. That's, that's the truth. Um, so many people get started with them and that's okay. Uh, you learn a lot. They benefit from our cheap rates as well. And then try to aim for those uh, foreign companies. And that's, the, the, there will still be some issues there because by default, you're located in Argentina, you'll get offered a lower rate, let's say, uh, or in Latin America in general. I know also that English into Spanish is probably the cheapest language combination right now, or one of the cheapest, um, but you will immediately start earning more money than if you work for local companies. Uh, so that's my number one suggestion. And then I always tell students or newcomers that you can still earn good uh, rates, European rates, let's say. So we end up being in a good position, actually, because we live in Latin America, we have a lower cost of living, and we can even earn European rates. So I would aim for that, definitely. And maybe that's why you see so many people in, in those conferences, uh, because they are Argentinian, there's a huge economic crisis, but they are working in an industry that allows them to work for foreign companies, just like software development, that happens a lot here. You see a lot of developers earning really, really good salaries. And they live in Latin America. They enjoy the low cost of living, but have a very good salary. Do you negotiate in dollars? Yeah, of course. Okay. And, and I, was, I don't I, I, I was just, yeah. companies. <laughs> the, uh, the, the, I mean, I, I'm looking at the exchange rate. I, I lived in Japan for six years and um, it was 100 yen to the dollar typically when I was there. And now it's 150 and they're thinking it might go to 200. And I'm like, oh my God, it'd be half price. You know? <laughs> So it's uh, yeah, that, yeah. that geo arbitrage well, thing is, is is cool if you can work it in your favor. Um, what in terms of of um, challenges to getting into the game industry? What I mean, I guess you kind of touched on it. You got to get that experience. Is there anything else? Yeah, well, the experience is definitely number one, and then. Well, the tests are very hard with companies. Gaming, both gaming and localization agencies, the the tests you need to pass, you need to start working with them or be included in the freelancer pools. They're usually super hard. I would even say that they are much harder than the, than, than the real job itself. Uh, so many people fail them. Don't be discouraged by that. I mean, you can fail them maybe because you still don't have the knowledge but maybe because just Revere didn't like your style, since I was telling you that this is a very creative industry, there might be creative differences. You know, maybe I translate, I have a certain style uh, and the reviewer has a different one and you're out. Uh, but don't get discouraged by that. Um, you can try again and again, maybe in a couple of months. I have failed tests and then passed them a couple of months later. So, yeah, I mean, that, that's a big challenge. And then it's good, you know, to speak the same language, especially if you're working with direct clients. They realize when you know what you're talking about and when you're not. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that non-gamers or people that don't play cannot work in the industry because I know great translators and reviewers who don't play. They just work in the industry. Just as you don't have to be a doctor, you know, to translate medical stuff. Right. Um, but it helps, in my opinion, a lot. And usually people who want to get into game localization are gamers. So that's, that's usually an easy thing for them, but it's something to consider. If you don't play, try to at least, uh, you know, watch gameplays, get, jump into Twitch, try to see what people are doing, how they speak, what they say, learn about it, just as you would learn, again, medicine or economics. Do do you? I mean, great advice. Mm -hmm. do, and I'm just curious. Do you like have a kind of target word rate for yourself? Um, when I was on the operational side in the LSP um, part of the business, you know, mm -hmm. we would say that, for example, financial texts, uh, a typical translator would do, you know, 250 to 300 uh, words an hour, 
Uh, and we wouldn't want to go beyond that um, typically because then usually quality would degrade. Um, not always, or yeah. people get burned out. I mean, do you have like a, a target rate for yourself? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I try to push myself to increase a little bit. However, that depends a lot on the game. Mm -hmm. uh, as I was saying, I do regular work for two or three games, so I can probably get up to 500 words an hour, wow. but not more than that. I have colleagues that can do like a thousand words, which is crazy for me. <laughs> um, but then maybe I get a new job from a new game and I kind of go over 200. Oh, you know, because it's that, that, that learning process, right? Exactly. Or you get user interface. User interface kills my brain, you know, <laughs> even for games that I know or having to translate item names. Oh, those are very hard. So it's not easy to to have an average and always be on that number. Well, uh, it's, so, so in the context of what you just said, but also before you mentioned uh, fuzzy matches and machine translation output, yeah. do you have do you go with word rates on that, or do you do hourlies, or do you mix? No, I usually just go for word rates. Yeah, even on um, MT post editing. I don't do MT post editing for gaming. Honestly. Okay. I haven't done it yet, at least. Okay. Who knows what, what will happen in the future, right? But I know the gaming companies are starting to do that, but not my clients. Okay. Awesome. Um, but in any case, I think that, I don't know if there will be a huge difference. You know, maybe they will still pay by word. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't really know how that, that's handled. Okay. Um, another question on the business side, you mentioned that, you know, ideally you want to go uh, work directly for overseas organizations. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that could be LSPs, but it also could be gaming companies directly. Um, what's yeah. the best way to make contact with those organizations? Cause I'm sure they get thousands of emails every week. That's a good question. Well, I haven't worked for LSPs for at least seven, eight or nine months. Uh, so that has been a huge change for me. Since I joined MemoQ, I stopped working for LSPs. Okay. Uh, no, not completely, but quite a lot. And I'm focusing on, on direct clients. I don't have dozens of direct clients. I don't need them. I'm just a freelancer working for myself. Yeah, sometimes I work with teams, but I'm not an agency, right? So I don't have dozens. Uh, in some cases, I've been contacted by the clients. They found me on LinkedIn, on Pros, wow. online. Um, fortunately, I think I have a nice online presence with my my website as well. Your game in Spanish, um, so I've been working hard on that, and it paid out. Um, and then, yeah, contacts as well, networking. You know, the the gaming game vocalization industry is not huge. Mm -hmm. So we kind of know each other. Mm -hmm. I have lots of friends in the industry. They recommend you, you recommend them. So that helps a lot. And sometimes just cold emails end up working. Not always, of course. Yeah. Uh, but if you have something that sets you apart, uh, I think it's, it helps. So for instance, since I created my brand, I had my website, my own domain, that helped a lot. I mean... If you receive an email from someone who looks at least professional, sure. uh, it sets you apart from someone who writes from Gmail. Something very basic like that. That's some, some great advice. And yeah, that social presence. Well, if you don't have it, what else are you going to do? Like you said, a, a Gmail uh, email to people. And um, But the other thing is, is like offline events. Um, I, I, it's always good to go out and meet people uh, as well. Yeah, of course. Um, so... Of so course. Um, what did you let me ask you this do you ever get a request and they say hey you know it's we have this huge project can you um it's 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 too much work for a single translator maybe it'll, it's enough for three or four right do you take those on and sort of project manage it out to others or do you say hey, you know what i just i'm just a translator because it's because you, uh, yeah. you, you could very rapidly get kind of pulled into that project management role right yeah, I mean, I'm thinking of my current clients. Two of those, they have their own freelance pool of translators. So even though they are direct clients, they have a localization department and they take care of the management okay. themselves. So I'm just one translator. If I cannot do the whole thing, they'll just 
ask another one in the pool and they'll split it. However, I do have another client who just sends me the files and I take care of them and I can do whatever I want with them. Uh, of course, whenever I have to get some help, I will ask the client, at least I did the first time, you know, to make sure that he's okay with that, no confidentiality issues at all. He said, yeah, no problem, as long as I have the translation. And I've been in that position uh, because sometimes it's a lot, yes. Um, so with that specific client, I try to work on the game myself because I enjoy it. It's a programming, programming game, so uh, it's a game to teach kids to write code and I like coding as well. So I like translating the game, but sometimes it's a lot. And for those cases, I use MoQ, of course, <laughs> to manage uh, the project and just split it with two or three colleagues. And in that case, I usually review. I don't translate that much. I just give them the translation. I review, uh, make sure that everything looks good and consistent. And, and yeah, so I do a bit of managing and reviewing as well. Awesome, man. Awesome. Hey, um, let me ask you when you're, um, when you're, when you're not working and you're dealing with all those distractions down there in Argentina. So wh wh what's yeah. your, and aside from gaming, like obviously you, you do that. Um, uh, yeah, but, right. but, and, and you told me earlier you had a couple cats. So, uh, <laughs> what, 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 what else do you do? Uh, what's your favorite uh, way to, for, to pass your free time? Well, I really, really like, uh, movies and TV series. I love them. That's why I started subtitling mm -hmm. at first. Uh, and I also really enjoy photography, videography as well. Yeah, I really like the, the audiovisual world in general. That's, that's, uh, that's really cool. Um, any any uh, recommendations for movies or TV series? Oh, we could spend hours talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> what's, something, uh, what's something new? What's something new that's uh, recently come out that you're like, oh, wow, this is pretty darn good? Ha, I wasn't expecting this question. Uh, I've recently, well, mixing gaming and the audiovisual world, I've watched the latest cyberpunk okay. anime. I'm not an anime guy, mm -hmm. but they made a, a TV show on this huge game that was released some time ago, Cyberpunk 2077. And I said, okay, I'm not really into anime, but I've heard it's good. And I really liked it. I mean, I saw, I watched it in like, four days wow um <laughs> yeah yeah it's very short it's just 20 minute episodes yeah. uh, it's really addictive so it's it's good um i mean other shows that i really like i've been enjoying atlanta a lot mm -hmm. that's that's a super funny but at the same time worrying show yeah i love those kinds of things for my pen to take um, notes but I, I just realized i'm recording this so i don't need to take notes <laughs> you don't need to. <laughs> so that's good yeah hey well then let me ask you this um because we're going to wrap this up here um yeah this is obviously we've had our conversation in english uh what should we do should we do subtitles or voiceover what are your thoughts uh here in argentina we are usually subtitle lovers uh but i know that a good dot movie or show can be really good. Uh, so I usually just use subtitles, but I do use subtitles, even though maybe I don't need them for English content. I just enjoy looking at good subtitles. And, and how, how, because, you know, we've done, I don't know, maybe 22, 23 episodes of MimoQ Talks. Um, if we've never yeah. had subtitles, what's the best, best way for us to do that? Huh? Well, right now there are many good automatic uh, subtitling options. Mm -hmm. We usually trans transcription. I don't know how good the translation works, but I mean, of course, going with the full human subtitler is usually the best, uh, best thing to do in my opinion, but you can combine like automatic transcription and then get someone to translate. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good way to do things well, a bit. Well, quicker, you, you, you know, I'm going to be asking you for a favor here after <laughs> sometime next week. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. so hey, Santiago, uh, last question. Are you, do you have any, any uh, travel plans to go to any industry events in the coming uh, six months or so? Uh, hopefully with MemoQ, uh, we are, we are thinking of being present, you know, in industry events, uh, our current hub is about to go to Korea, uh, as well. I'm not going myself. Oh, Cause I thought you were, that's right. You, you, we're sending somebody else, right? Yeah. 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 We're sending somebody else. Uh, I know Marines going we have and, a, um, and we have a Korean colleague as yeah. well and a very technical, 
or best technical guy going there. So yeah, that, 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 those are like our immediate plans yeah. and we're thinking of next year as well. Uh, so hopefully I'll meet clients and new people awesome, there man. as well. Well, as yeah. you, as you mentioned, um, you're, you're, you're on LinkedIn um, and people can contact you there for questions related to gaming, related to MimoQ. You also have your Game in Spanish uh, website online as well. So if anybody wants to reach out to you, they can do that. I'll put uh, links in the show notes. Hey, uh, Santiago, it was great talking with you and uh, hope we can uh, cross paths one day soon. Yeah, I'm sure we will. Okay. Yeah, I'm pleased. If anyone watching this wants to talk about games or MemoQ, I'm always happy to do so. Awesome, man. Take care. Cheers. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining Memo Q Talks, where we talked with industry leaders about their experiences and lessons learned to gain new insights about what works best across all areas of localization. Join us next time on Memo Q Talks.